Right. Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so um, I wanted to introduce our visiting professor, Dr. Shah. It's an absolute honor to have him here. I consider him a colleague, a friend, a mentor. He's an um, internationally recognized uh, thyroid surgeon, um, currently at Sloan Kettering as an attending surgeon, and is also the, the Jatan Shah uh, professor, as well as professor at Cornell um, University. So um, Dr. Shaha um, grew up in Bombay, or actually Baroda, not Bombay, in India, and then um, uh, did his uh, residency at Tata Memorial Hospital, which is one of the biggest cancer hospitals in India. And uh, in 1975, came to the United States uh, and uh, did his surgical residency at Downstate uh, in New York, followed by a head and neck fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and then joined the faculty of, at Downstate, uh, where within 10 years, 1982 to 1992, quickly rose uh, through the ranks to full professor. Uh, during that time, he was also um, the chief of uh, the VA service at Brooklyn. And then he moved to Sloan Kettering, uh, was it in 1993? And has been at Sloan Kettering ever since then. Uh, but Dr. Shah has an amazing CV, uh, I think 300 pages. He's had uh, 600 publications, 462 in PubMed. Um, because of his international recognition, actually, a number of countries have him as their honorary member, Brazil, uh, Korea, India, and you name it, a lot of countries have uh, invited him as an honorary member because of his involvement with these uh, societies. He's uh, also been a leader both at the local level in New York where he's been president of the Surgical Society in New York as well as nationally. So we had two separate societies, the Head and Neck Society that from the general surgeons and then the Head and Neck Society of the ENTs and they merged um, in 1999. Um, and Dr. Shah was the first um, co-president because these two societies merged and was so successful because I think after your talk, you'll see how, what a dynamic person he is. And I think, you know, made that happen because it's obviously a lot of po politics when two big surgical societies merge. Um, but um, Dr. Shah has won a number of teaching awards at Downstate, at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and in fact, he's uh, started in Cornell uh, a preceptorship for medical students because of his involvement with teaching. So I um, want to uh, welcome him, and he's going to talk to us. He's got an interesting title to his uh, talk. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good noon, whatever you want to call. Uh, is, you know, one of the interesting aspects of giving a talk is the 12 o'clock is the worst time to give a talk. You, know? you can't let the people do anything. They want to eat, you, can't, you come in their way. They want to go take a snooze, you come in their way. And one of the reasons, you know, I was telling keep the lights on is I need to know who is sleeping so I don't disturb them. <laughs> right, that's a very important part. Otherwise, they will go out and say, I don't know what he was talking, but he disturbed me throughout my sleep. So I'm not going to do that. So the topic I have taken is the uh, topic of thyroid cancer. And having given one talk this morning, I wanted to make sure there's no major repetition. But I'll try to condense as best as I can. And the title of my talk is Over Diagnosis and Over Treatment of Thyroid Cancer. This is one disease where there is an enormous overdiagnosis, and I'll prove that to you and I'll show it to you. It is also a disease where we are over treating a large number of patients. The standard of care in the United States for thyroid cancer used to be total thyroidectomy and radioactive iodine. I think that is too, too overkill for patients who have small thyroid cancer, and I'll show you that. So I start my talk with this slide. When a thing ceases to be a subject of controversy, it ceases to be a subject of interest. So this is so true when it comes to thyroid cancer. I like to show this slide. This is one of the ancient Indian statue. 
You can see one of my forefathers operated on this individual. This was 3000 years BC. In uh, one of the Indian excavation, they found this beautifully healed person, very happy. I think we can, we hope we can maintain that stature all along. I showed this slide this morning, but I want to show it again, re-emphasizing the amount of literature that is available. Every two hours, there is a new paper in the literature on thyroid disease. By the time we sit down for dinner, there will be one new paper in the literature on thyroid cancer. It is the same paper I have been writing for last 20 years. You do not think I have contributed anything new. It is the same paper once I write in Hindi, once I write in English, works out very well for me. As long as I get it in the PubMed, I do not care what happens. So this was perfectly okay. This is what we do all the time. But what is more interesting is this Google search. And every patient who comes to see you, whether it is thyroid cancer, colon cancer, or pneumonia, they know more about that disease than you do today. Because they come prepared. They read the night before. They are very well prepared with million dollar questions to you. And it becomes, at the end of the consultation, it looks like you are gone for your board exam. And that's what I feel. And at the end, I, don't, I always ask them, did I pass or did I fail? Very interesting. So I showed another slide this morning, but I want to show you this one. The 80% of you will forget 80% of what I said 80 minutes after the talk. So by this afternoon, you are ready for another talk. So just keep that in mind. So we show this slide all the time just to re-emphasize what has happened to the thyroid cancer. There are two human cancers with rapid rise in the United States. One is uh, thyroid cancer and the other is melanoma. Very rapid rise. The good thing about thyroid cancer is very rarely one dies of thyroid cancer. In melanoma, a large number of patients die of melanoma. Much different disease. So you will see here, you will notice here the rapid rise from 1973 to 2010. There is almost five-fold increase in thyroid cancer. And there is always a debate about this over diagnosis. Are we opening a Pandora's box? Were these people living happily with the microcarcinoma and now we have a tool to find it out? And we will go through that detail in a minute. But what is interesting is, you will notice here, the majority of these are microcarcinomas below 2 centimeters. What is the survival in this group? 99.5 percent. There is no other human cancer with such excellent results. You take pancreatic cancer, the first thing you start talking is, what is my insurance? Who is, who, whose name goes in my will, who is my healthcare proxy, but not in thyroid cancer. It's a routine standard cancer where the survival is excellent. Now, we do need to go through this history. This is very important. The Chernobyl nuclear accident occurred on 26th of April 1986, and there was a rapid rise of development of thyroid cancer, especially in the pediatric age group in Belarus. Ukraine and Soviet Russia. And you will see here, in Belarus, there was an almost 15-fold increase in, of thyroid cancer, especially pediatric age group, and they were a more aggressive thyroid cancer. So if for any reason one is exposed to Chernobyl or the recent Japanese nuclear accident, there is going to be a rapid rise, and a large number of these patients are going to have aggressive and fatal thyroid cancer. So the question comes when we talk about overdiagnosis. There is a true increase uh, in the early group of thyroid cancer, and there may be slight increase in the advanced cancer also. Whether this is again the impact of diagnosis remains unclear. If you do the ultrasound on everybody in this room today, believe me, 20 percent of us are living with thyroid nodules, and five or six percent of us have microscopic thyroid cancer that we are living happily. You get ultrasound, you get a needle biopsy, your life becomes unhappy. Because somebody is now wanting to operate on you, somebody is going to give you complications, you are going to be on thyroid medication for the rest of your life, you are living so happily. So we need to find out a way to see if we can change our attitude in the management of thyroid cancer. In other words, can we reduce the over treatment? And that's what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes. So this is a detection of subclinical disease. These, again, just go back to what I said. Six percent of the American population 
has microscopic thyroid cancer. And how do we know that? We haven't taken out their thyroids, but the people who died of other reasons and they had autopsy studies, we found the thyroid cancer in about 6 to 10 percent of them. The highest incidence is in Finland, 32 percent. Amazing. So, these are the geographical variation. And there is also increasing diagnostic studies like the ultrasound, CT, MR, PET scan. And these are the studies which will prove that there is a small microscopic cancer. There is also increased pathological scrutiny. In the past, when we sent the thyroid specimen to the pathologist, they made three cuts. Now they make about 25 cuts. So they will be able to find a 0.1 millimeter microscopic papillary carcinoma. The minute they see it, they have to report it, they cannot hide it. And then it becomes a headache for me to tell the patient, you have cancer, but don't worry, nothing is going to happen to you. They don't believe in me. They think I'm crazy because I'm supposed to die of cancer. And that is not true in thyroid cancer. There is a whole organ study, the entire specimen is now embedded and they will do the minute submillimeter cancers can be found. There are routine imaging studies. Where do you get those imaging studies? The Korean experience. In South Korea, the, the government at one point, few years back, made a decision that routine neck ultrasound is a standard evaluation, like a mammogram or like a pap smear. You get a routine ultrasound. It was available at the every street corner for $30. So you can imagine a lot of thyroid cancers came up. A large number of microcarcinomas came up and they went for surgery. Uh, unfortunately, the reported incidence of complication was very high. So now the entire Korean medical group is revisiting whether is it appropriate to do the ultrasound routinely and is it appropriate to operate on these individuals. Routine imaging of the neck is very common. The ground zero in New York, the ground zero patients have a special unit at Mount Sinai where they evaluate for their pulmonary problems and other medical problems. They get a routine CAT scan, routine ultrasound, find a small thyroid cancer. Uh, these people probably had it for a long time and they would probably live without any problem for a long time. But once we have found it, then we have to treat them. And that all goes to the court ground zero financial uh, whatever the arrangements are made. Uh, clearly, there is an overdiagnosis of a large reservoir of cancer. Uh, there are certain organizations called as Light of Life Foundation, which writes in their website that this is an aggressive cancer, take care of it. There is a whole website called as checkyourneck.com. So go to the doctor, check your neck. As a matter of fact, there is an editorial written by our group recently, don't check your neck. And the United States, uh, 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 the preventive uh, group has endorsed that, don't check your neck on a routine exam. So whenever you give a talk, there are certain slides which are very important. You have to have a slide from New York Times. I don't know what is with it, but you have to have a slide from two groups, one from New York Times and the other one from New England Journal of Medicine. If you have the slide from New England Journal, your talk is a true, authentic talk. Nobody can challenge that. So this is a slide from New York Times. This, was, this came about three years back, um, an epidemic of thyroid cancer. Now you may be wondering, why do I show it? Because my name was quoted there. You know, the greatest joy in life is seeing your name on a slide or in New York Times. You know, it may be for anything else, you know, but your name is there. So this was the epidemic of thyroid cancer. Ladies and gentlemen, it is not an epidemic, it is pandemic. And many of you probably know the word pandemic, which was used for smallpox, polio, typhoid, cholera, you know, these were the pandemic diseases all around the world. And this is the pandemic of thyroid cancer we see around the world. And this is a Korean study, very interesting study. You can see here from 1990, let's go to 1999 to 2011, take a look at the amount of increase of thyroid cancer, almost 15 fold. Why? Because they made a routine ultrasound as a standard practice in Korea. At somewhere around 2014, let me show you the next slide, the, the Korean government and Korean surgeons realized that we are doing too many thyroidectomies from 2001 to 2012. Take a look. 
from 1,000 thyroidectomies in Korea to 12,000 thyroidectomies. They said, are we really helping these people or we are hurting these people? So in 2014, the physician coalition group in Korea decided, we're not going to do routine ultrasound, we're not going to do routine thyroidectomies. And they reduced the number of thyroidectomies to almost 50 percent. What does that mean? The remaining 50 percent are living happily with their cancer because nobody found it, nobody operated on them. And that's the philosophy we have when we talk about overdiagnosis and overtreatment. So if you look at the papillary microcarcinoma, these are all microcarcinomas. I told you in Finland the incidence is 25 to 35 percent. In United States, it's about 5 to 10 percent. And I'll show you some figures about that. Uh, in the United States, there are 5 to 10 percent living happily with thyroid cancer. Now, if you look at it very critically, if you take the 5 to 10 percent of the U.S. population, that will come to about 20 million individuals in the United States living happily with thyroid cancer. Now, what is the in, uh, real number we see in the United States? In the United States today, there are half a million people with thyroid cancer. What does that mean? The remaining 19 million are hap living happily because nobody found their thyroid cancer. And that's what we call as overdiagnosis. These people are living happily. And this is what we see today clinically is the tip of the iceberg. And if you develop a technology or an investigation to find these microcarcinomas, you're going to find more of these. And the most uh, uh, concerning invitation, investi investigation is the ultrasound of the neck. You do the ultrasound, the radiologist will find 3 millimeter nodule. Some smart radiologist will put a needle in it and tell you you have thyroid cancer. So our answer to the question to them is, so what? Unfortunately, the philosophy we have learned in prostate cancer, that a person can live happily with prostate cancer, and will probably die of cardiac problem than prostate cancer, we have not used that in thyroid cancer. Because we still worry about thyroid cancer, what is going to happen? Let's just do a little sobering calculation. The 17.5 uh, 17 million people have thyroid cancer in the United States, if you take the 6 percent. The overall incidence that we have seen is about 350 to 500,000. That means we are identifying only 2 percent of real cancer. The remaining 98 percent are hidden. They are living happily. This means that we are still missing 17 million people in the United States with thyroid cancer. And let's hope and pray that we don't find a tool or investigation to find these. If you do that, the only operation we'll be doing in the United States and only health care will be providing is thyroid cancer. That's all. There is nothing else. So this is what we call as incidentaloma of the thyroid. I love this term. This was the term we used for, pen, uh, for adrenal at once upon a time. Now we use it for thyroid. So where do we find the incidentaloma? Routine physical exam. And this is very classical. You go to the otolaryngologist for ear problem. That person is not interested in your ear because there is nothing to be done for the ear. You know? Just clean up the wax, you are fine. I'm sorry, Jitarian. But that's the reality. So that person is more interested in your thyroid. He feels the enlarged thyroid, sends the patient for ultrasound. Very appropriate. OB checkup. Obstetricians are taught to check the breast and the thyroid. Very important and good. Pregnancy prenatal. And these are very important. The imaging incidentaloma. So the CAT scan. When do you get a CAT scan? You have a little cough. You don't feel well. The throat is hurting. You get a CAT scan. The CAT scan shows there is a multinodular thyroid or there is a thyroid nodule. The, this is the classical that we see in New York. MRI done for trauma. You are driving the car on the Park Avenue. Somebody comes from behind and hits you. You say, this is the best day of my life. Because now I can sue the guy behind me. You know, and I'm going to make a lot of money. And, and that's the goal. And what is the way you make money? You say, I had the neck trauma. So you go to the emergency room. They do the ultra, uh, MRI. The MRI report comes that the brain is normal, spine is normal. There is a one centimeter nodule in the right lobe of the thyroid. And I love the radiologists in New York. They add one more sentence, cannot rule out thyroid cancer. Further imaging studies strongly recommended. I love it. You know, because then they all come to my office 
and they have forgotten about suing the guy behind. Now they want to see how they can sue me if I don't prove it is cancer. Amazing, you know, the practice changes. This is our pattern of practice. Okay, they come to my office. What do I do now? I get an ultrasound, I get a needle biopsy, and if the needle biopsy comes back as atypical, it is still a headache. So we live with this headache that is there is nothing I can do about it. This is the other one, the carotid ultrasound. You know, this is what we call as executive exam in New York City. You know, you go to this medical spa. So they do the colonoscopy, they do the gastroscopy, everything one day, and they announce that in one day, we charge you $25,000, but we found a 3 millimeter thyroid nodule in you. Somebody does a needle biopsy and they announce that we were the best diagnostician because we found your thyroid cancer. So this is what happens. And the last but not the least is a PET scan. And this is very popular in a cancer hospital. You can't walk in memorial without getting a PET scan. Even the, when you come out of the taxi and ask the gen, uh, uh, security guard, where do I go? He will direct you to the PET scan. Go get a PET scan, then Dr. Shaha will see you. I love it, you know. Because then they will come up with this PET scan, a hypermetabolic nodule. What do we do about it? We publish a paper. These are pain in neck. That's why we call the PET associated incidental neoplasm. Very common. We see that at Memorial, a large number of patients, about 3% of our patients show this. Uh, keep in mind, a large number of them are malignant, so don't neglect them. But the management of these pet incidentaloma will depend upon the which is the primary tumor. If they have lung cancer, we don't worry about thyroid. They have breast cancer with metastasis, we don't worry about thyroid. They have ovarian cancer, which is a long-term good result, will continue to manage the thyroid cancer like it is. And I like this term, this is called as incidental incidentaloma. So this is a new term. This is a you know, when you are in academic practice, you need to come up with something new jargon. So this is my jargon. So one was ultrasound of the carotid. You had no business to do the ultrasound of the thyroid, but they found the thyroid nodule. The ultrasound of the breast. You know, the, we have got a couple of radiologists in New York City. While they are doing the breast ultrasound, they gradually go to the thyroid. I don't know why they have to cross that clavicular line. They go to the thyroid, they found the thyroid nodule, they tell the patient, from the radiology suite, I get a call. There is a patient with thyroid cancer, what do I do? I say, simple, send them to me, I will operate on them tomorrow, no problem. Now the, the thyroid surgeon cannot go from the thyroid to the breast, but the breast surgeon can go up, right? So these are, this is one of the common problem we see. The worst is this one, if you are attending the ultrasound course, Believe me, somebody will tell you, can I examine your thyroid? And always say no, because they will find a thyroid nodule. Once they find it, they will send you for ultrasound guided needle biopsy. The highest number of uh, positive thyroid nodules are seen in patients volunteering for ultrasound or the ultrasound technician. You know, when they are in their uh, college, I mean the, the studies, they do the ultrasound on each other. And believe me, we see one patient every week with thyroid cancer. Uh, this is very interesting. A, visit, a, vi, a relative visiting the sonographer. The sonographer said, I am a good sonographist. Why don't you, I will do it for free for you. And the worst is, when a wife goes for ultrasound, the sonographer says, I can do you free. You know, you are her husband. I don't have a problem. Unfortunately, the husband has thyroid cancer and the wife has a benign goiter. Very common problem. That's why I call this uh, incidental incidentaloma. So, just talking about the incidental incidentaloma, let me show you one second. Um, this was a uh, picture in the New York Post uh, in 2007, and the title was that mugger saved my life. A woman was mugged. So, what happened when she was mugged? She went to the emergency room. They did the ultrasound of the neck because she was hurt, found the thyroid cancer, and she got surgery. So she was so proud of this mugger that you saved my life, you know. So now we have a philosophy, mug everybody, you will find thyroid cancers. <laughs> so one of the house officer, uh, the one of the prominent surgeon was asked by the house officer, are you telling us that all nodules should be removed surgically? And like everything, down, he looks down his long nose, 
certainly not young men, only those referred to me. In New York, we have little different, only those who have got good insurance. Everybody else comes to Seaport, you know, right? Okay, so let's just take a philosophical ca case. This is a 75-year-old man. He has never seen a doctor for 50 years. Now he gets a carotid ultrasound for screening. They found an incidental thyroid nodule, 5 millimeter. What do we do? Tell him, go home, come and see me next year. But it doesn't happen in America. So what happens? He gets a needle biopsy. The needle biopsy shows he has a papillary carcinoma of the thyroid. This is a 75-year-old man living very happily. Now we're going to make his life miserable, correct? So what are our choices? Our choices is total thyroidectomy, make him as miserable as you can with complications and taking thyroid pills for the rest of your life. Tell him, come back and see me in six months. Or tell him that you should not have had a needle biopsy, but you had it, I'll follow you. Very difficult, believe me. The word cancer is very annoying to the patient and the family. He may agree with you that day when you have gone to his office, but next day somebody is going to tell him that you are crazy, you are monitoring your thyroid cancer, this is wrong. You need really need an operation. And he will come back to you, you will do the surgery. Now there is a debate, do you want to take do one side or you take out the whole thyroid? And I think we have made some determinations that the decision about extent of thyroidectomy should be made based on gross finding. There, there is no reason to take out his whole thyroid. Leave the other side, he won't have parathyroid problems for the rest of his life. Let's go to this gentleman, he is 85 year old, he has a metastatic colon cancer, he gets a chest x-ray and chest CT which shows a thyroid nodule and that is papillary carcinoma. His life is going to depend more on his metastatic colon cancer than thyroid cancer. Sit down with him, talk to him, let the endocrinologist talk to him, see him every six months to make him feel that this is there for a long time and does not need any active intervention. Let's go to this 23-year-old young mother. She's not losing weight. She goes for TSH and T4, which is normal gets an ultrasound and finds a 5 millimeter cancer. She is 23 year old. What do you want to do about her? Again, the same choices. Observation, surgery, total thyroidectomy, lobectomy. And there is nothing wrong in this patient to be observed. This cancer may have been there for last 5 years. Repeat ultrasound in 6 months, a year. If there is no major change, continue to monitor this patient. And the Japanese have been doing it for the last 25 years. They have been monitoring more than 2,000 patients with thyroid cancer without surgery. Unfortunately, that has not been practiced in the United States very often. We just publish our series of last 10 years, 300 patients at Memorial being observed with no unrewarding outcome. We are very happy with them. Uh, what they need is a reassurance that both the endocrinologists and surgeons are behind them. So what is the whole philosophy of observation? What is the natural history of small thyroid cancer? That's very important. How common are these? We, we showed that before, 10% of these are uh, uh, commonly seen. What are the risks of surgery? Clearly there are risks of surgery and what are the risk benefits of surgery? So just to answer what is the clinical question? How many of these grow over a period of time? Only 10% of them will grow. So 90% will remain stable, that's the bottom line. And if we follow them carefully, we'll be able to select out who is growing and who is not growing. And keep in mind, they don't go, grow exponentially to become inoperable, incurable, or uh, likely to die of thyroid cancer. That just does not happen in papillary carcinoma. How many uh, people will develop nodal metastasis? 2 to 3%. And keep in mind, the nodal metastasis in thyroid cancer does not have poor outcome. They live the same normal life. Very important to keep that in mind. So the knee-jerk reaction in the United States is total thyroidectomy, RAI, thyroid suppression, and thyroglobulin follow-up. This is probably overkill in patients with microcarcinoma. Remember, decision is more important than incision. We can operate on anything. That's not a problem. But am I going to help the patient or not? And that's very important to make a decision. 
Keep in mind the complications of thyroid surgery are directly proportional to the extent of thyroidectomy and inversely proportional to surgeon experience. And, and this is not only for thyroid, for almost everything in life, every surgical problem. Keep in mind these patients will be on lifetime thyroid medication and there is clearly a change in quality of life. Ask a young woman who has undergone total thyroidectomy, her life is not the same. God gave you an organ to produce natural hormones to live normal life. You take it out, yes you can live happily, your blood test will be good with thyroid medication, but it is not the same life. It is like being diabetic, yes your life is, lifespan is the same, it does not change, but the misery with which you live with diabetes is the same as with thyroid medication. When the surgeon talks about the number of performed cases divided by 2, when he talks about the complications multiply by 2. You know. Surgeons have a bad habit of forgetting their complications or a good habit, whatever you want to call it. We love to forget our complications. So uh, we talked about this before, the complications, the thyroid medication taken for the rest of their life. Uh, the hypoparathyroidism is a worse complication that young woman will be taking thyroid medication for the rest of her life during pregnancy, delivery, breastfeeding and it is not easy to handle those complications. In spite of what I have said, there is an enormous increase in the total thyroidectomy in United States. Why? Because occasionally the preoperative ultrasound will show nodules on the other side. The endocrinologist may push the patient to get total thyroidectomy so they can give radioactive iodine. But I must say the new ATA guidelines are going away and away from routine use of radioactive iodine. Very few percentage of patients will require radioactive iodine and still very few percentage will be benefited by radioactive iodine. Uh, the patients have a fear of recurrence or persistent disease and they want a scan. The patient wants to make sure my rest of the body is clean. They do not have faith in you, so you do the scan. And the most important part which we call is the Google syndrome, Dr. Google. What we are lacking in the Google is the first line in Google should be thyroid cancer can be monitored. The second line should be a conservation surgery is appropriate, but that does not happen. You open the Google, the first thing is total thyroidectomy, the second is radioactive iodine. And I think we need to change that. You open the prostate cancer, they talk prostatectomy as the last. They talk about observation, follow up, PSA. We need to change that culture in thyroid cancer. Okay, so what are the surgical pre principles? At Memorial, we have find the risk groups, the prognostic factors, and this is most important. Avoid over treatment and treatment related surgical and medical complications. And what are the surgical complications? The three most important hematoma, nerve injury and hypoparathyroidism. And if it is a bilateral nerve injury, permanent tracheostomy. And what is the, uh, what are the medical complications? Hypoparathyroidism and inability to adjust to the thyroid medication. And these patients will go from endocrinologist to endocrinologist because they just do not feel well. And there is no, no, there is no effective way to say what to do about this. You start putting them on T3, you know, the cytomel, see if that helps, change the thyroid medication from Synthroid to Unithroid to something else. But again, there is nothing that can tell you what helps and what does not help. So let me just show you this interesting slide about, sorry, the Japanese experience. I mentioned to you about the large Japanese experience. They published this few years back, 1400 patients. They decided not to operate on them. He started at Kobe Hospital with a surgeon by the name Miyawuchi. He started this and they decided that they are going to put the patients on active surveillance. So whether you operate on them or you put them on surveillance, the mortality, the recurrence, the increase is the same. So they were able to prove for the first time that observation is a good choice, active surveillance. See here, there is no outcome difference. So you just monitor these patients and if you see some changes, the increase in the size of the thyroid nodule, then you operate on them. Um, this is the observation study from uh, Japan for microcarcinoma and you will see here over a period of time, 
the, the follow up showed that the nodal metastasis was seen uh, in about uh, 3 percent of the patients and increase in the size of the nodule was noted in about 5 percent of the patients. So, you still could avoid surgery in 95 percent of the patients. This was a monumental study and I am I'm amazed at the Japanese group doing this. We should have been in the forefront, but we always have the IRB issues, the debates, the controversy and uh, medical legal, legal fear. You know many times we do not make major progress in medicine because we have medical legal fear. I think they did a great job. So, what are the philosophies of observation? This slide is very interesting. I took a lot of time to uh, prepare this slide. Change the name, change use the word micro papillary micro tumor. Tell the patient you have papillary micro tumor, she will love it. Then saying you have micro carcinoma. There is a new term that has been used for some of these lesion called as indolent lesion of epithelial origin. It is called as idle. Tell the patient you have idol in your neck, she will be so proud you know, I am living with idol rather than telling her you have thyroid cancer. And this word papillary microcarcinoma was coined by Virginia Livolsi from UPenn, who is one of the foremost pathologists in thyroid cancer. And she said it is wrong to call these carcinomas, call them micro tumors. The next is use the example of prostate cancer, that is very important, we never use that in thyroid. Train the treating physicians, tell the treating physicians not to get upset with this. We need more websites in the Google, we need public education and we are always worried about medical legalities, we need to go beyond that. And the last one which is my favorite, this is not really active surveillance, it is deferred intervention. We are deferring the intervention till the tumor either gets bigger or gets lymph node metastasis or shows some signs of un uh, um, unfavorable outcome, then we will operate on them. So, this is the data from SEER. In spite of what I have said, you will see in United States 74 percent of the patients underwent total thyroidectomy. So, we need to change the scenery of thyroid surgery in United States. Now, this is our uh, little complicated slide, very important when you give a talk, you should have a couple of complicated slides and you know, and you say, nobody can read that. But the reason I have made this slide, this is the contribution of memorial. We are, not, we are dividing our patients into ideal candidate for observation, appropriate and inappropriate. So, what is the ideal humor? Uh, less than 1 centimeter or two, uh, uh, 1 centimeter, yes. Uh, no infiltration into the surrounding areas, no lymph nodes and solitary thyroid nodules. That is very ideal. That is what we see in a young woman, very classical. What is appropriate? Up to 2 centimeters, irregular margins, questionable lymph nodes and the FDG may show thyroid cancer. An inappropriate is a large tumor, more than 4 centimeters, infiltrating the surrounding tissues or nodal metastasis. So, we have now looked at this thyroid cancer as a who is the ideal candidate, who is appropriate and inappropriate. And if your patient fits this group, it is very appropriate to monitor this patient. With that in mind, we just published our recent experience of 291 patients. You can see here and you will see here at the follow up, there is no outcome difference whether we operated on them or we monitored them. But you have to have a group of physicians sitting with the patient, a surgeon, endocrinologist and with the family and leave the door open. When they call, do not neglect their phone call. Tell them, yes, I will talk to you you are not happy, come and see me tomorrow, I am available. If you do that, the large number of these young patients will be very happy to be observed and followed. In spite of that, what happens to me? This is a typical consultation. I get a call, I need urgent appointment. And by the time the day is over, I get a call from the CEO, the chief of department of surgery. Why? Because there is a young lady with 5 millimeter papillary carcinoma, whose father is a president of another institution. Okay, come and see me. We need to develop a, 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 a relation with our endocrinologists. We need to tell them what does it mean by thyroid cancer and we need to take that fear of the sea, which is very common in United States. Let the punishment fit the crime. This is a basic principle in medicine. You know. Let us do what is most appropriate for the patient. Now, this is a slide that I have borrowed from one of my endocrinologists. 
he calls it wisdom of Shah. I don't know why he's used the word wisdom, but the idea is don't miss the boat. In other words, the larger tumors, extrathermal extension, nodal metastasis, offer them surgery. Don't wait for them to get bigger and bigger. What are the bad factors in these small cancers? The lymph node metastasis, not good, we would operate. The extrathermal extension, major vascular invasion, the high grade histology, which is difficult to identify in a needle biopsy. Or occasionally, when you have done a molecular study, which is not routine, but if you have done a molecular study like TURT, if the TURT is positive, it is considered to be aggressive cancer and we would generally operate on them. So you need to know the biology of these microcarcinomas and how to monitor them. What are the adverse features? We had just talked about it, irregular extrathermal extension, distant metastasis, aggressive histology, and this is the most important, psyche and anxiety. There are patients who come, they want appointment in next five hours, they want operation in next 24 hours, they are not candidates for observation. They will go home, they will get surgery with somebody else. So you need to make sure that their psyche and anxiety is well controlled. What is the over treatment, the surgical treat, over treatment of total thyroidectomy, the surgical over treatment of radioactive iodine and follow up. Generally the patients who undergo lobectomy, they need minimal follow up, ultrasound once a year, the blood test twice a year. I showed this slide this morning, but the debate about the lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy has very little meaning in thyroid cancer. Majority of the micropapillary carcinoma, the outcome is 100 percent. You can't do anything better than normal living. This is a very interesting slide. You can use it for almost any presentation. The fact that you can do a total thyroidectomy does not necessarily mean it is indicated in all patients with thyroid cancer. An operation not worth doing is not worth doing well. So you can always, the one of the major argument of total thyroidectomy proponents is I can do a good total thyroidectomy without complications. But if you don't need it, you can take out my thyroid, you know, what's the big deal? I'll just leave with a small scar, no problem. But you, I don't need it. That's the bottom line. So whenever we talk about thyroid statistics, these are the two slides, very important. The first law of statistics, if the statistics don't support your viewpoint, you obviously need more statistics. And the second law is, um, I don't know why the slide got swallowed. I can see it here. Let me see if I can do that. Okay. Okay, something happened, but that's okay. The second law is given in stat enough statistics, you can prove anything. That's so true in the in Murphy's law. Okay, so this is my favorite slide. Okay. I love this slide. And this is what we call as a professorial slide. One, you can use it only if your full title is professor, uh, because nobody knows what, uh, what is in this, right? And you are supposed to entertain the audience by saying, I'm sorry, the people in the back row cannot read it, even the I cannot read it. But the question somebody asked me, why do you show that slide if you don't know what is written on it? The advantage of this slide is there is always a smart medical student in the audience who at the end asks you tough questions you know, for, about which I have no answer, because they are smarter. So I say, you remember that busy slide? It's all there. Go back to my presentation, you will find the answer. Okay? This is a world literature on thyroid cancer database. And I like to use it. I saw it in one of the journals. I couldn't resist using it. Okay, so what do we need in management of these microcarcinomas? Individualized, personalized, and precision treatment. Again, you can use it in any human cancer. It's the same philosophy. So we need to, if you look at the over diagnosis and over treatment, we need to use the example of prostate cancer. We need some celebrities. You know, in prostate cancer, there are many celebrities with th prostate cancer living happily without operation. Giuliani, you know, the, almost every mayor of New York City. The same thing, we don't have that in thyroid cancer. We need a true celebrity with thyroid cancer announcing that I have thyroid cancer and I was not operated. But that's not going to happen. Somebody is going to operate on them. The Google needs to come up with this. Avoid FNA. Observation is a good option. And it is not that we are observing, we are differing the intervention. That's the philosophy of microcarcinoma. 
Now, the Japanese did a lot of studies. I will conclude in five minutes. They did a wonderful study. They looked at the age groups because people were afraid that the young people were going to neglect their cancer and it is going to grow. That was not true. What he showed was very interesting. In the 20s and 30s, there is about 40 percent chance they will grow and come to surgery. But above the age of 50, see here, very small percentage. So, there is nothing wrong in observing young people as long as you monitor them, 60 percent of them you will be able to avoid operation if possible. And this is the over 50 percent of the patients in the 20s and 75 percent of the patient in 30s will be able to avoid surgery, very important and good studies from Japan. So, what we need to do, I am just going to skip this slide, is develop a balance between the cost and the benefit. And the new ATA guidelines which came last year, they, the surveillance management has been offered. This is the first time the national guidelines endorse the philosophy of continuous monitoring. And this is very creditable to the people who wrote the guidelines about observation. I am just going to take two minutes. This is one of the tumors where the, the, there is a reclassification of the name. The tumor that was called as encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma at one time is now called as non-invasive follicular neoplasm, means we are downgrading from cancer to precancer. This is the only human cancer that I know where yesterday it was called as cancer, today it is not called as cancer. Very interesting information. And this again came in the New York Times last year. Uh, uh, and that raises a lot of questions whether the patients are going to get upset and they are going to call us and say, I want my slides re reviewed whether I really had cancer or not. Very interesting concept that became very popular uh, and this is the change in the nomenclature from encapsulated follicular variant of papillary carcinoma to what now we call as NIFP. And here this is from New York Times, it is not cancer, doctors reclassify thyroid tumor very interesting concept. And as a matter of fact, the new staging system, I will show you the slide, where they are downgrading about 35 percent of the patients who were considered stage 3 or 4, now stage 1 or 2. So, the entire understanding of the thyroid cancer is now revolving around biology of thyroid cancer. Okay, so, this is the United States, States Task Force of Prevention, a recommendation on thyroid cancer screening, do not check your neck. I mentioned that before, but this is the publication from JAMA that do not check your neck. The more you check, the more you are going to find. So, the decisions in thyroid cancer management are made by surgeons, endocrinologists, nuclear physicians. Do not forget about complications. And the person who has to face the complication is a surgeon. He has to face the complications. What is the institutional philosophy? And the most important is, what does the internet tell the patient? Patients are well prepared and who is your boss? Your boss has to agree with you. If there is a disparity of opinion in your institution, you are not going to enjoy it. It is going to be very difficult. Luckily, we are very fortunate at Memorial. We have got some outstanding endocrinologists who work with us and we have, we never give an opinion to the patient unless we have clear understanding. You know why the patients get upset and they come to Memorial? Because they get di diverse opinion from their surgeon and the endocrinologist. If you can amalgamate that and make one opinion, that will be a great service to the patients. So, just to go back, active surveillance is not avoiding surgery, is deferring the surgery or intervention with watchful and masterly inactivity. You are not neglecting the patient, you are monitoring them more carefully, more with the understanding of the disease and more with their input in their management. Keep in mind, thyroid cancer is still a surgical disease. This is the surgeon, a real surgeon. This is an endocrinologist, what we call a pseudo surgeon. But you need to find out the real surgeon and take care of the problem as you know. And again, we always say when we are managing these patients, do not miss the boat. Good judgment comes from experience, but experience comes from bad judgment. And it is very important in the management of thyroid cancer that we avoid bad judgment. This is the tip for the audience. 
invite an endocrinologist for drinks and dinner. When we invite our endocrinologist, they are more interested in drinks than the dinner, but that's perfectly okay. You know, I have no problem with that. I'm just going to conclude by showing one case. This is a 28-year-old medical student. She undergoes ultrasound of the neck during routine radiology rotation. You know, she's in the radiologist's weight for rotation. They find a 1 centimeter nodule on the right side, a 5 millimeter on the left side. I don't know why, but she undergoes needle biopsy. The right side, which is larger, is benign. The left side is papillary carcinoma. So the bottom line is she has a 5 millimeter papillary carcinoma. This is a 28-year-old girl. She's a medical student, and believe it or not, she is going to get married to an endocrinologist in nine weeks. What do I tell her? Let's operate on you tomorrow, so you are ready for wedding. You may have complication. Your voice may change. You may not be able to go on your honeymoon because you are hypoparathyroid. Or we can monitor you. I don't have real answer. What would I do if she is my family? I'll tell her, go home. I'll see you in a year. But that requires a lot of thinking, a lot of thought process. And I need to spend a lot of time with her and her husband would be husband that this is the best way to monitor. Obviously, she came with the understanding that I will do the surgery tomorrow, so she is ready for her wedding. That is not right. Keep in mind, these, there are always two sides to the coin in medicine, whether it is thyroid cancer, prostate cancer, colon cancer, breast cancer. But if you look at it realistically, where does the controversy come from? This slide is very interesting. Commonplace clinical problems in medicine are approached in a diametrically opposite ways by physician with a similar training background, having read the same literature. No, it's the same literature. I read in the same literature everybody else reads. But what do we do with that literature? We interpret available information differently based on unique personal experience, vision, and the most important thing in medicine is prejudice. You can change that word from prejudice to ego. It is that ego which brings us to debate. It is that ego, you know, we read the same data. I showed you the same data. Tomorrow I can come back and give the same talk saying that those one percent who get into trouble are more important to me and convince you that this is not the way to go. So we interpret the data based on unique personal experience, judgment, and prejudice. This is what we call surgical ego. It's is quite a bit and that's why we go to the debate. Remember the basic principle is the good physician treats the disease, but the great physician treats the patient who has the disease. And our job is to ta take the patient as a whole. I showed you that medical student purposely to give you a message that our decisions are not made on the disease itself, but the patient herself. She's an intelligent girl, she will understand and she will be happy to be monitored and will not blame me because she needs operation in two years or three years. Um, there are certain basic rules. When you give a talk, you cannot finish until you start, right? So very important to start on time. When you don't know what to do in the operating room, we have very small philosophy, use irrigation. When you don't know what to do in the ICU, very simple, steroids, right? Uh, many physicians would not have slept well if there were no steroids. We get a call at 3 in the morning. There are two things I always tell them. Do the cardiac output and give the steroids and call me in the morning. In the morning at 7 o'clock, I am not on call. Right? That's the principle of surgical experience. Publish your results before the tumor recurs. It's very important in surgery. And you can use this telephone number. This is my uh, toll-free number. But remember, I gave you the whole talk against operating on thyroid cancer, correct? So many of you must be thinking, what is he going to do? He has no practice. Where is he going to support his family? You know, the wife and two kids. Don't worry. I'm an Indian boy, so I can always open Shah's grocery. Okay. So this is, uh, I can do this. And if this does not work, because the grocery shop closes at 7 in the evening, I can always have, like many Indians have, pick up service from the taxi. And when Julia Roberts come and uh, Cherry Ann comes on the airport, they generally travel together, Julia Roberts and Cherry Ann. I pick them up from Kennedy Airport. Thank you very much.
Dr. Shaha to uh, give grand rounds to the surgery department this morning. And uh, uh, I know as surgeons here, we have such an amazing endocrine division. Yeah. Yeah, just like you all have it slow. You've got a great group. So. I heard a lot about uh, your group and I think that's very important. Working together and developing a center of excellence is very critical. And once you develop the center, you'll keep getting patients. Whether you like it or not, mm -hmm. they will come. So do we have any questions from the audience? So I have a um, couple of questions. One, you mentioned um, dirt. Yeah. Um, if you get BRAF, I know it's controversial, yeah. but a microcarcinoma BRAF yeah. positive and yeah. pathology. Does yeah. that change? No, not for BRAF, uh, because the BRAF guru is at Memorial, Jim uh, Fagan. He came from Cincinnati with BRAF, and we are not used BRAF either clinically or prognostically. The TURT, we have not used it ourselves, but we have heard a lot of stories about TURT, and that's why we are using it. If somebody has done TURT and it is positive, we'll operate on the patient. You know? But again, uh, we feel that the microcarcinomas are truly microcarcinomas. I know we get the report one centimeter tall cell. We don't get upset about it. It's fine. You know they behave the same way as a routine. But since there has been many publications that the TURT is a prognosticator, we just cannot neglect it and tell the patient you don't have worry. Now remember, all these BRAF and TURTs and other ones, they have clinical features which are adverse, irregular margins, or a firm nodule, or the ultrasonographer saying I don't like this nodule. Most of them will have something more than just a third mutation. But yes, if somebody has done it, it is positive, I'll operate on the patient. And then how about location of the thyroid yeah, uh, good microcarcinoma? Point. Excellent point, yeah. The, the tumors which are in the posterior part, in the tracheoesophageal groove, uh, we have very low threshold. We would operate on them. No. Uh, now, if they are truly intrathyroidal and the sonographer can tell, I'll buy time. I don't think there's any rush to operate. But those which are in the posterior location, we are concerned because when they come out of the thyroid, they can uh, uh, um, infiltrate into the nerve. We are not seeing that, but it is something that we put in the equation. Remember, we are on our learning curve with these nodules. So we don't want to take everybody and say, I don't want to operate on you. So those which are firm, those which are hard, those where there is a lot of anxiety, posterior location, third positive will operate probably we will be operating more than we like to, but that's good. Any other questions? Thank okay, you. back to our lunch. <laughs>